Hey, welcome to a Zion People podcast. I am Keelan, an intern at Zion Church, and this is our latest message. The team here hope the message challenges you, inspires you, but most of all, builds your faith. Enjoy the message. Amen. Well, it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, this is uh, the last Sunday of the year uh, for as, as far as gathering in this building goes, but we know it's not the last Sunday of the year, and we know it's not the last time that we'll lift up the name of Jesus. So... Uh, Times are good. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to point out uh, as an opening statement that church attendance is at an all-time low worldwide. And yet, when I speak with people, they say to me that their faith is still strong. And which is more important, attendance or faith? Obviously, faith. But as God's people, we must really determine whether or not the space of time that we're in and the space of church that we're in, we've got to determine whether this is an interruption or a disruption. What's the difference? Well, an interruption is a momentary shift in normal circumstances that will at some point see a shift back to the way things were. But a disruption is an unsettling change that has no possibility of reverting back to previous normal. And a disruption usually precedes the establishment of a new normal. So these are the two things, and we've got to look at what's happening and try and determine which way we want to interpret things. Uh, Churches all across America, um, it's horrible what's happening in other nations as far as COVID goes. Even last night, I heard that Sydney is potentially going into uh, the risk of another lockdown over Christmas, quite close to home. In America, record numbers of deaths now every, every day. Two people die every minute of COVID in America, so the news said last night. And churches over there, some of them are gathering in small groups, some of them not at all. Many people are choosing to stay at home or have to stay at home to try and journey as a faith community. And and even today, we have many people joining us online as we live stream this service. Lockdown. How many people remember lockdown? Andre and I were just talking. March felt like it was seven months long this year. Well, April certainly did. Lockdown in New Zealand is an example of an interruption. It was a momentary shift and a change with the hope that things would revert back to normal. And as we saw, in New Zealand at least, lockdown 1.0 didn't last forever. So lockdown is an example of interruption. But here in New Zealand, if you look across the statistics and you talk, talk to church leaders as I do, you will see that church attendance in New Zealand is declining. Some would say as high as 50% decline in church attendance in in in-person gatherings like this in New Zealand. And I shared statistics with you earlier uh, this year that the average person who calls himself a churchgoer in New Zealand attends church 1.2 times per month. 1.2. That's the average based on research. So that would mean the average churchgoer goes to church in person about 14 times a year. This would indicate to me that we're in the midst of a disruption, a shift, a change, and we've got to discern what God's doing in this time. So this series, Church Without Walls, is actually all about us trying to look for what God is saying and what God is doing. And and I want us to look at life from a different perspective. Now, please hear this. You did not hear me just say that we are not meeting or gathering together as a church. That is not what I just said. But in times of uncertainty, I always find myself looking back to what God is saying and doing. It's it's the hope that we have is that we have a father who wants to be involved in our lives and wants to lead us and guide us. In 2019, we went through a rebirth And in that season, God said very clearly to the leadership of the church from Hebrews chapter 12, once again, I will come and I will shake the heavens and the earth so that only unshakable things remain. Mm. 
In 2020, during lockdown 1.0, God said to us from Joshua chapter 3, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you will see the Lord do wondrous things amongst you. And all year we've been watching as he has consecrated us, purified. And in some cases, as I was thinking about this year, you could even call it purging. Now we're only seeing the first half of that verse, and there's still the second half to go, and perhaps when the consecration is complete, we will see the Lord do mighty works amongst us. Disruption causes us to rethink. Peter, the apostle Peter, was praying on the roof of a house and he gets called by God, by an angel visitation, to go and visit a man called Cornelius who was a Gentile living in another town. Peter went obedient to God and as a result of the conversation, or the meal they had and the conversation they had, very much outside Peter's comfort zone, as a result of that conversation... The entire household of Cornelius believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of the world, the Son of God, the Messiah that was promised, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. As a result of that disruption, church was birthed in the Gentile nation. The walls of the temple, as it were, fell down. In 1517, how many of you were... No. No one. Okay, 1517, a guy called Martin Luther. How many remember Martin Luther? Martin Luther, uh, upset at what he saw in contrast to the scriptures and revelation that God gave him, nailed 95 theses to the wall of the church. And what we saw out of that was called the Protestant Reformation. Theology of the church was reformed in a new space of revelation and church for everybody has changed ever since. Catholic Church and the Protestant Church reform worldwide. Many, many times in history, God has moved through circumstance, through tragedy, or through season in order to bring a shift. Several instances that um, I studied over lockdown around revival saw an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit that radically transformed the way people live. The Celtic revivals were of particular interest to me as they were on remote islands and what they called thin places searching for God to see Him do amazing things. The Azusa Street revival that happened in California in the early 1900s Remarkable outpouring of the Holy Spirit where they literally looked and saw like the building was on fire, but it was the fire of the presence of God. And in that space, God chose to use a half-blind black man that no one liked in order to bring the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Who would have thought? Some church leaders didn't like it and therefore missed it. So, Church Without Walls, this series is an opportunity for us to see what God might be doing in this time. I personally think God is pushing a reset button. I haven't quite worked out what is on the other side of the reset button, but I'm happy to wait and see what he's doing. So last week I announced to you that there was going to be an interruption to the way that we operate on Sundays. And all that means is that we're not meeting in this building until the end of January. But it does not mean that there's no church. It does not mean that we're not gathering together. It's shifting and it's changing and it's an interruption to the way we operate in order that we might sense what God is disrupting in us. So, as you came in the door, you would have been asked if you wanted one of these. And uh, some of you got a different version, but uh, this here is your guide to church over the summer. Uh, For those of you that were um, out and about during COVID, you'll be very familiar with what a QR code is, and whilst the COVID app that the government gave you won't work on this, your QR reader will. Now, if you don't know what a QR reader is, then there are alternative options, which you can get available in booklet form. But what, what is the point of this? So I sat down and I thought, well, what does church look like? Church looks like family, it looks like connection, it looks like prayer, it looks like worship, it looks like devotion, and it looks like um, a meeting around God's word. Six categories that define church loosely to me. And so on this card, if you have one, you'll see there are six categories 
And if you choose to, you can scan one of those QR codes and it will take you to a website, a page on our website where there is an activity for you to do that is church. It might not look like this, but it's still church. Because church is not a building. Church is not a meeting at 10 a.m. Church is not a group of people that sit facing towards one guy. As Chris said to me years ago, church is more than just sitting in a pew looking at the back of the head of the guy in front of me, which is absolutely true. It's about life together. It's about meeting together. It's about gathering where Jesus is, is in the midst of what we're doing. And, and I'll promise you that could look just as much like a, a barbecue as it looks like a worship service. Peter hosted church in Cornelius' house when they ate a meal he wasn't familiar with, and the Holy Spirit fell because Jesus was in their midst. So I was joking with the elders about this, and I called it a bingo card, because some of you might like to just try and strike across one line, see if you can get a whole line, and then you can call bingo! Or you might like to go vertically, treat it like Sudoku. Or some of you might just prefer worship, and so you're going to tick all those off first. It doesn't matter to me. You get to choose what church looks like. If you get there and you don't like what you see, then on the right-hand side of the website, you'll notice there are all the categories there. You can click on that and you get to choose something else. The point is, you get to choose. You get to choose how you gather together, who you invite round to have a devotion, who you meet with in the park. You get to choose where you go for your meal or where you go for your picnic. You get to choose who you worship with. You get to choose who you pray with. But please, don't use this as an excuse to check out of faith for four weeks. That would be the worst outcome. We tested the technology, and as far as our test goes, it works. Um... Subject to your ability to use a QR code scanner, which is on everyone's smartphone. If you don't know how to do that, find a young person. If you don't have a young person, borrow a young person. Okay, um, but of course that's why we put these book and booklets together. I'm really grateful for the admin support that I had this week. Someone stepped up and said, "Hey, I'll help you with that." And they took everything that was on the websites and helped me put it into a booklet form, so you can have that uh, if you wish. One of the things that um, I'm, um, I'm aware of with some of the crazy things that I come up with is, uh, oops, sometimes that I, I, I think I think too fast and move too fast and people don't quite hear what I'm saying. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting some help around that. I've actually gone and I've got someone helping me to be able to work through that and communicate more effectively. And one of the things we talked about this week was... Uh, to, to use a technique, which I'm going to do right now, which is called polarization, to allow the expression of views from one extreme to the other, um, both of which are helpful. So I'd like to ask you two questions about what I just talked about so that you can help me. Would you, would you guys like to help me this morning? Some of you. Some of you are still thinking about what is a QR code. So the first question, if we could... Um, um, Maybe have some house lights up, Eugene, so I can see people. Um, what, what, would be, what would be good about what I just talked about? What is, what is good about, what's positive about this opportunity we have? Louise. We maintain our relationship with each other and with the Lord. Andre, you were going to say something? Church is not only on a Sunday. Thanks, mate. That's good. Carla. Getting to know members of the congregation more intimately. Personal connection. Learning. Yep. What else is positive? Yes, right at the back. Teresa. Yeah, practically navigating meeting together with little kids. Very good. Jacob. Being together with God, absolutely. You're learning how to use technology. The responsibility to connect with God and with others is on us, each one of us. Yes, Mike. 
having people in our homes that might not normally come to church. Imagine if you did church with people that aren't yet saved. Heaven forbid. Any other comments? It it helps prevent loneliness, that's right. Well, let me ask a second question. What's potentially not positive about this proposed? Yvonne. Having contact numbers so you can reach out to people would be helpful. Yes, thank you. People having uh, lethargy. Isolation is a risk, absolutely. Henri. Yeah, you could go without doing it and spend your whole holidays by yourself. Yep. Complacency, can't be bothered. Yeah. So Gary's saying one risk is last time we shut the church because of COVID, numbers decreased and a lot of people didn't come back. It's a risk. Disruption. So how could we overcome some of these things? Contact? Keep in contact with each other. Find ways to get in contact. Yes. Get out of your comfort zone. Yes. Anything else? Yes, Teresa. Say again. Yes. Yeah, so Teresa's saying she's prone to making excuses of why she wouldn't do it. And she said instead of listening to those excuses, she should follow the prompting of God and do what he's suggesting her to do. Have a realization that I, we, we are the church, each one of us. Interesting. Good. It's great. I'm hearing... I'm hearing good and I'm hearing potential not so good, but I'm also hearing ways that we can overcome what is not good. As I shared in the um, family video update during the week, on the Sunday the 24th of January, we are going to be gathering together with a couple of guitars and some food, and uh, Chris has still offered... <laughs> He, he, does Yvonne know that you've offered your house? Excellent. Okay, so out on Story Road there, we'll post it up on Facebook, we'll send emails, we'll send messages out. Um, it's going to be a time of gathering together to have that family time on the 24th of January. Yeah, great. So Chris is saying it's super natural life that we lead with God. And also that church isn't just limited to Sunday. There are 27 activities on this card. If you only do it on Sunday at 10 a.m., we won't see you for six months, which is not the goal. Yeah, there are messages on here. 20, I recorded four 20-minute messages this week, which three of them are not yet there. So if you've found a QR code that's not working, it's one of the messages I haven't posted. But there's 20 minutes there. You can sit down and watch that and have a conversation about it. There's um, suggestions for worship that is beyond just music. But the point is, church without walls looks different. I want to um, unpack some of the why behind we're doing this. As I've been um, searching God's heart around What is it that he's really pushing? Because this is not just about an excuse to lock the building and not come back for five weeks. It's not not the point. The point, I think, is God is trying to push us into something or lead us into something. I mean, they say sheep are easy to lead. I'm not so sure because I used to have sheep. If that was the case, why do they have sheepdogs? 
So God is trying to lead us and corral us somewhere, and the point is to try and find what that is. Last week, I shared a, a, the opening message for the series um, called Church Without Walls, and, and I said to you that the mission has not changed. God wants to see this world introduced to his love, and he's chosen to use the church, the ecclesia, the body of believers to do that. The mission hasn't changed. Today, I want to talk about some of the how. We are to point people to God, and I'd like to suggest to you that this looks like Pathways to Jesus. And today, I want to title my message, Pathways to Jesus, and I want to take you to a story that's well known. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, Jesus goes on a walk in the heat of the day. He's traveling, as we can read, he's traveling from uh, Judea, his home area, his base, and he's traveling to Galilee. And instead of going the normal route that the Jews took, the long way, he went through Samaria. And today, we're going to look at this, the story where he meets the woman at the well, the woman who's a Samaritan, the woman who lives in Samaria. And this story is going to guide us into how we can think and how we can behave so that we might become the church without walls. So let's look at our character um, aside from Jesus. Let's look at a character in the story who is called the woman at the well. Let's notice the four things about her that are important for us to understand so we know what the context of the story is and why this is an important story. Clearly, this is a woman. Secondly, it's a Samaritan. She lives in Samaria. Thirdly, she is a divorcee. We'll read that in the story in a minute. And fourthly, we find her alone, by herself, in the middle of the day. Why are those four things important? You can see on the screen there. First and foremost... She was a woman, meaning it was forbidden for Jesus to talk with her alone. The Jews, especially the rabbis, were very, very particular that that man who is called a rabbi must not speak direct to a woman. It was part of the way they were brought up. It was part of the Torah. It was forbidden. And here we have Jesus breaking the rules. Secondly, she was a Samaritan woman. The Jews despised Samaritans. Why did they despise them? Well, when one of the Assyrian um, kings came in to conquer God's people, he put some of his people in with them, and they became a mixed race called Samaria. And the pure Jews, the ones that are purebred, they're kind of like, we despise you half-breeds because you're not purely God's people. And they wouldn't even talk to them. They wouldn't cross the road to see them. Samaritans, the Jews, did not associate with them, and you read that in the story. Again, Jesus breaks with tradition. He disrupts a pattern. Thirdly, you see that she is a divorcee. She's unloved. Five times she has been divorced, and the man she is currently with is not her husband. You'll read that in the story too. But what you need to know about culture in this time is that a woman does not get to choose if she is divorced or not. A woman cannot leave her husband. But a husband can kick her out when he wants. Five times this woman has been brought into a man's home and then been kicked out, divorced, publicly shamed in front of her entire village. Because you've just got to remember, I mean, if that happened to me at Taumudu five times, we'd probably hear about it. But this town is not as big as Tiamudu. This is a collection of families that all live on the side of a hill. She's been used, abused, and rejected five times. And the man she's currently with won't even marry her. And finally, she's alone. Some scholars say that the reason she was at the well in the middle of the day was to avoid the eyes and the shame and the scorn of everybody else in the village. Whether that's true or not can't be proven. But nonetheless, she was at the well by herself. But I want you to notice this. This woman was the sole object of the focus of Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting? Not the one you would have thought, not the one he should have talked to, not even the one that you think he would, uh, he would try and uh, approach. Jesus makes a point 
And the language and the original meaning of the Greek, um, I don't have all the notes here, but some of the stuff I read this week, it says Jesus chose, it says he needed, in verse 4, he needed to go through Samaria. God ordained an appointment with this woman, and Jesus knew he needed to go the way he would not normally go. It's a setup. I wonder who God's going to set you up with this summer. Who is God going to cause you to bump into outside your comfort zone? Someone that is forbidden, someone that's despised, someone you wouldn't choose to talk with, someone that you wouldn't normally invite into your home or choose to have a meal with. I wonder what God's setting you up for. As we unpack the story, I just wanted to talk about the pathways to Jesus, and I wanted us to see that um, in the Scriptures we can see a pathway. Jesus doesn't rock up and say, Hail, woman, I am the King, I am the Messiah, and you shall come to know me. He doesn't say that at all. So let's look at the pathway that Jesus follows. And I've got the references here. There's going to be items up here. and At the end, you might want to take a photo of it. Um, but look, we see here, first and foremost, in, in John chapter 4, verse 5, So he, Jesus, came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. What's the point? We've got to be immersed in the local community. The problem with church is we get together on Sunday in a building with and no one, no visitors come, and we happy and we clap and we sing and we go, that was awesome. But we're not immersed in the community. The point of church without walls is that we would do church outside of the building and try and be immersed into the local context. The second reference you can see on the screen there, verses 10 to 14, he made a connection with her. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you water, living water. The woman said to him, sir, have you, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. The water I will give will become in him a living fountain, a water, a springing up into everlasting life. Jesus makes a connection over a conversation and brings about something of the revelation of who he is, we've got to be available for these conversations. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged by this because I, I notice my patterns. I rush from meeting to meeting. I get in my car and I drive as fast as I can to my next appointment. I'm trying to do four things on the way to going to dinner with someone. I'm busy. I'm cramming my life. And I'm concerned that I don't make myself available for encounters like this. Busyness has become an idol, and I'm really convicted by it. In verse 15, there's an opening. The woman said, Sir, give me this water, that I might not thirst, nor come here to draw. We've got to be sensitive to the needs around us, you know? Like when when we have an encounter with someone that we wouldn't necessarily plan, but that God set up for us, there is a reason he set it up. We've got to be sensitive to the cues. We've got to be sensitive to the the comment. We've got to be sensitive to why is it that God has got me talking to this person? We've got to be open to it. We've got to be sensitive. We've got to be sensitive. Did you see the woman says in verse 15? So I don't need to come here to draw water. And when I read that this week, I'm like, there's a clue. She doesn't even want to be there. She ought to be out in the open. She ought to be open to the shame and the scorn of others. She's like, if I can avoid that, Jesus, show me how. Sensitive. When people respond with their needs, we've got to zoom in on that. I used the word zoom because I thought this year most people are, are real happy with zoom. 
I was listening to a podcast the other day, and it was a guy who used to be a traveling speaker, and he's used to being on a plane and, and traveling around and stuff, and he says, man, I've been doing it all by Zoom, and I've got Zoom butt. I'm sitting in his office all day doing Zoom meetings. So I put Zoom in. We've got to Zoom in on what's happening. We've got the reference there in verse 16. Jesus says, Look, give me this water so that I may not come here to draw water. There's the clue. And Jesus zooms in on that response. He says, oh, go call your husband and come here. He was going after the, the wound in her heart. And we're going to see that shortly. When people share their needs, we must be responsive, but we must also trust that God is drawing them to himself. You are merely a vessel in God's hands. God has a purpose, and he is drawing them not to you. He's drawing them to himself. One of the books that I've been reading uh, with regards to Church Without Walls, and I, I, I read it last year, and I've been rereading it this year. It's called City of God. And it's written by a pastor from Canada who has revolutionized how they serve their town and demonstrate God's love. On on midnight, on Fridays, they serve burgers. And they serve burgers to the pimps, the prostitutes. They serve um, burgers to the druggies and the drunks. And they've done it for years. Free burgers, who wants a burger? I don't want to get into the whole story, but I want to read you this quote. One of the men who was on their team has written a, a discourse in their, um, in their journey, and he says this, On one particular Friday night, the summer heat turned into thunderstorms, and we moved the social part of flipping Fridays inside our church. I sat on a bar stool in the alley, minding the grill, which is a barbecue, for those of you that don't know American language. As usual, I was hollering. Free burgers at passers-by. Here's the key. Waiting to see who God wanted to draw into his Holy Ghost tractor beam. He knew that God was drawing people to himself and that those that would respond were those that had an opportunity for a conversation. You don't have to force people to accept God's love. We have to trust that he's at work. In verse 21, you can see the reference. We see an opportunity here. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is of the Jews. The hour is coming and is now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such who would worship him. What's the opportunity? To see Christ revealed. The opportunity in conversation is about Christ being revealed, and we've always got to be ready. Well, first of all, we've got to make sure Christ is in us so that Christ can be revealed through us. There's always going to be an opportunity. What I love about this is Jesus then shares a testimony, and usually we would say, well, share your testimony about Jesus, but what do you share when you are Jesus? The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Ultimately, the conversation has to reveal Jesus Christ. The gospel message is the message of Jesus. The message of hope is the message of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is the Savior of the world. The gospel message is a testimony that means Jesus Christ is revealed. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to memorize scripture. You don't have to hand out tracts. All you've got to do is have a little bit of Jesus in you that might overflow, that might spill out. This is how Jesus changed my life. I was once without hope and I was dark and I was hurting myself and Jesus came and rescued me. Like You don't have to be eloquent Because if God is drawing to himself and his Holy Spirit is convicting them, then they will respond to him, not you. You don't look convinced. In verse 28, the woman left her water pot and went to the way to the city and said to the men there, five of whom she'd been with, she said to the men, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out 
of the city and came to him. So she, this woman, did you notice she'd come to the well to bring water and it says she left her water pot. Suddenly, suddenly her water didn't matter to her. But more than that, she went to the men of the town. Suddenly her shame wasn't her limitation. Why? Because she'd seen Christ revealed. The gospel message only happens when we choose to point other people to Jesus and they see him. It's not about us. Oh, but I'm not very confident and I can't talk, you know, eloquently. This is a woman who has had five of these men as her husband. She's living with one who won't take her as her husband, and yet shame is not her limitation. What's your excuse? The gospel message is Jesus Christ revealed. In verse 39, many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. What's the fruit of someone who sees Jesus? They proclaim, they testify, they lead others to salvation. That's why Jesus Christ doesn't usually appear in physical form to most people. He's asking us to be that representation. He's asking us, and we should expect, we should be expectant to see a harvest, which is salvation. People choosing to respond and accept that Jesus is the Son of God. I love about the end of the story in verse 40. When the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his own word. And they said to the woman, now we believe, not because just what you said, but we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. This is transformation. This is the kingdom of God. When we pray, thy kingdom come to earth, on earth as it is in heaven, that's what it looks like. People coming to remember, accept Jesus Christ. And I suppose as I finish that slide there, I would say this, people of God, if we want to be ready for a move of God, then we need to be ready to be used by God. The people of God are the message of God. Someone took my clock away. They were worried I was going to preach till two. That just makes it even harder. Technology is not a dependent requirement for being with people. So you can definitely, this is yours, Doug. It's got your name on it. One of the um, geeky theology things that I, I kind of geeked out about this week as I was studying this is in verse 6, the woman talks about Jacob's well. And John, when he writes the story, he uses a Greek word for the well. I won't say the word because I'm not a scholar. But he uses a Greek word that could be translated as a flowing stream. Because, of course, that well taps down hundreds of feet into an underground river, doesn't it? Right? She uses that word. But in verse 11, when she talks about the well, after she realizes who Jesus is, or she's coming to realize... The Greek word that John uses means cistern, which is a tank, not flowing. And because it doesn't flow, it has the risk to become stagnant. And it's not until verse 14, when Jesus speaks of the living water, John reveals that Jesus is the source of that living water, not the well, but Jesus Christ himself. It's kind of a geeky theology play on words. And I'm thinking about that in relation to the church and church without walls, and I'm thinking that which was has the risk to become stagnant if it doesn't flow with the life of Jesus Christ. Too many churches are containers that are growing stagnant. It's just a thought. So let's shift all that across and talk about Te Aumuru. Pathways in Te Aumuru. Um, I want to explain to you, we have a, a Shine for Girls program that's run for the last couple of years. I use this as an example because this is uh, a group of facilitators going into schools of Te Awamudu and working with young girls who are referred to the program 
And the facilitators run through a program that helps these girls to have um, value and dignity and worth. One of the negative sides of that program is that we're not allowed to preach the gospel in the school. If we did, the school would shut us out. So what we've decided to do is to do the program and honour the school and build relationship with the girls and their families and then have more than one step in the pathway. And we're calling it a pathway to Jesus. So we build a relationship with them in the school and then we say, well, would you like to come to an after-school program? Some of them will because Jesus is calling them to himself. Those ones we have a relationship with, would you like to come to a youth night on Friday where we have fun and play games and would you like to come and hear about Jesus Christ? There's a pathway that is establishing trust in the relationship with the school and with the community. Operation Christmas Hampers this year was only a success because the community got behind it. But it wouldn't have worked if the church wasn't involved. The strength and the admin and the support and the venue. Church partnering with community to build trust. Stuff happened this week that was miraculous. And do not think that the two police officers that were running it weren't aware that miracles were happening. We've got another opportunity for 2021. This year we've been doing counselling in schools. A pilot program that started last year, we worked through this year, we've been in two schools this year. White Park Christian School being one of them. Three weeks ago, uh, one of the principals rang me, says, I need to see you, can you come? And we went and met with them. They said, the school program, this program in the school has been fantastic. It's changing lives. And it's not just changing the lives of the school, of the person you're working with. There's one particular girl um, who is self-harming, and so she's going through counselling. And the principal said to me, you're not just helping her, because there are five girls around her that have been heavily negatively affected by her self-harming. But the counselling is helping all of them. And it's helping the family. And she says, I've been talking to the other principals and I wonder if you could help us. There are 308 children in primary schools that need counselling in 2021. I'm like, yep, sure. But now I need to work out how. I got them down. I said, well, we could do about a third of that. So 104. 104 children have been chosen out of 16 primary schools in our region to receive professional counselling in terms one and two next year. We got the funding for it. But now we've got to find the counsellors. So pray for it. Pray for that program, counselling in schools. Because we're putting counsellors, this is the church doing this. The church has a relationship with the schools where we go in there and we are part of the fabric of their staff. We get to contribute to the staff. Is that fair? Is that what we've done at Waipa this year? The council has been part of the fabric of the pastoral care in the school, helping the teachers. But pray for this program, that we would continue to build trust with leaders in our community where when they've got a problem, they come to the church and they say, can you help? And when we have trust, we have influence. And when we have influence, Jesus Christ is revealed. 2022 and 2023, we're working on solutions with the community and how we can provide affordable housing to Te Aumudu. It's something that we're working on, and I'm looking forward to sharing more about that in the early new year. Uh, But this is an opportunity to see Zion established as a contributor to the social fabric of Te Aumudu and Waipa. We're not just a club that meets on Sundays. We're a group of people that get out there, roll our sleeves up, and do something to help people that need it. That's what church is. Church is not a building. Church is not a meeting that happens at 10 o'clock on Sunday. Church is a bunch of people who meet together, sure, and there's Jesus in the midst of it, but it's not limited to that. It's limited not only to the faith community, but far beyond that. We get the band to come back on stage. I'm going to wrap this up. But um, I want to point you to something in John chapter 4. So turn back to John chapter 4. I want, I want us to just to go and have a quick look at the pep talk that Jesus gave his disciples. Because I want this to be a pep talk to you and to me. This is a pep talk. 
John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said to his disciples, which is you guys and me, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say, There are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Jesus says, look and lift up your eyes and look at the field. Now in those days, they would have been in the middle of the countryside. The well was outside the city. They would have looked across the road and they would have seen a field full of um, probably barley, wheat or barley. And when wheat or barley becomes ready for harvesting, the heads of it becomes white, it changes colour. But I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. Because if you lift your eyes above the barley... If you lift your, lift your eyes above your circumstances, what you're going to see is different. I reckon the disciples looked up and they saw the faces of the people of Samaria coming towards them to find Jesus Christ. Well, we know that because they turn up and invite him to stay. And Jesus is giving us a pep talk. He's saying, lift your eyes above your circumstances. Lift your eyes above your comfort. Lift your eyes even above your tradition and your patterns and what you think you deserve as a Christian or a church member. Lift your eyes above your normal and look at the harvest field. It's white and it's ready and it's ripe for harvest. And he's not talking about grain or barley. He's talking about souls, people, the faces of people. Will you lift your eyes off? of your circumstances, to see the faces of the people in our community. May this summer be a fantastic time for us to reach outside of our building, reach outside of our context, and to reach in the community. Let me close with this scripture, Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The elders asked me to give you guys a practice at these challenges that we're doing, the challenges that you'll find in here, the activities that are church. So, the practice assignment for you this week, should you choose to accept it, is this. Meet with one other person and pray for those who may attend a church service in Tiamudu this year that wouldn't normally. Pray for those that God is calling unto himself. Pray for them. Because those that sow and those that reap both share in the joy of the master. The team are going to lead us through some carols. So why don't you stand? let's bless Jesus Christ because without him none of this would be possible Hey, thanks for listening I hope you enjoyed our message and it inspired you Stay connected and get amongst our family Find us on Facebook, YouTube or our app We are Zion People